All right, so yeah, there is a lot of <clears throat> um, things to say about this. So very often we want to compare algorithms like, I don't know, modeling algorithms, reconstruction algorithms. And typically um, these algorithms estimate something that we want to know. And they can do that with bias and variance or stated otherwise, they can make a systematic error and a random error. So if we do it over and over again, the systematic error would always be the same and the random error would be always different. So then there were many papers on comparing those methods. And in some of these papers, they say, well, this method has higher variance, but the other method has higher bias. And that's actually not very good. And the reason is that very often one can trade in bias for variance. And therefore, you have to be careful to make sure that you evaluate both methods for different variances and different biases if you're in a situation where you can exchange one from the other. And here is a simplistic method uh, example. So suppose this is the true signal we want to measure. And then we have two methods, A and B. And this is the output of method A, and this is the output of method B. And just looking at this, I think most people would say after a few seconds, well, it looks like B is in better shape. But then if we do it over and over again, or if we smooth it a bit, actually this is just obtained by smoothing both curves a bit, then you see that this is A and this is B. So in every point, there is a high random variation in A, which is much lower in B, but B has a systematic problem. So it depends on the application. If, if this is bad or not, but in many applications, actually such a bias would not be what you want. And in most cases, method A would actually be better. So, but this is still difficult to compare. So now we still don't know which one is the best. So one way to compare them is to just plot the bias uh, and the variance. So for, we vary, for example, the amount of smoothing we apply. And the more we smooth, the lower the variance will become. So that means the variance will go down here. But by that smoothing, we create bias too. And so you can see that suppose that I did this A measurement infinitely many times, then the random variations would average out and I would end up with the true curve. If I smooth it, then I kill the random variations here and here but I make an error over the edge because I'm averaging over that edge. So now I get bias in the edge. If I uh, compute the difference between the true value and this, I will see that here I overestimate and here I systematically underestimate. And I do that all the time. So that now I have created bias, but my random variation has been decreased. So that means typically these curves go like this. The while, when the variance decreases, my systematic errors go up. And they will do that for method A and for method and if we are in a situation like this, where method B, the curve of method B is above the curve of method A, now we can say A is better than B. Because you can see for a particular variance, we can obtain that variance with lower bias for A and for B. And similarly, for a fixed bias, we see that A can do it with less variance than B. So with those curves, you have better arguments to say, I'm gonna take method A. If you just have a point here and a point here, then it's very difficult to compute these points because you don't know how these curves are. They can run differently. So you have to compute the curves. So this is similar stuff you will find if you compute specificity and sensitivity because you again, you can trade in one for the other. And uh, usually there is a threshold. So you do a measurement and you say if, if, that, if that result, for example, you have uh, a scan and you do a SUV threshold and you say, I think this is a lesion if the SUV is above uh, four. Then you will find some lesions, but you will have some false positives. Then you can say, okay, I will, I will say only the lesions if the SUV is above 10. So now probably you will not have false positives anymore, but you will miss a lot of uh, true uh, lesions. The extreme is you can say, uh, I always declare, even without looking at the image, that the patient is healthy. Then you will have uh, zero false positives. You will never say that the patient is ill, although he is not ill. 
but you have zero sensitivity, of course. So you can always trade in one for the other, and you get a very similar result. If you plot sensitivity versus specificity, one goes up, the other one goes down. And again, it's safer to compare the curves than just incidental values that you obtain. All right. And then uh, another thing to remember, especially when you're working with iterative reconstruction, is that things that look good don't necessarily have to be correct. And if you say it like that, it's pretty obvious. But if you make reconstructions, it's not so obvious because it's very tempting to, yeah, you, you have two reconstruction algorithms and you look at the image and one looks really cool and the other one is noise, has some streaks to it and say, oh, it's clear the left one is better than the right one because I don't like noise and I don't like streaks. But that doesn't have to be true. And I know that there have been papers where they compared uh, 2D uh, image acquisition to 3D image acquisition. In the beginning, when they were still struggling more than now with scatter correction, it wasn't obvious which one of the two was better, and they wanted to figure that out. So higher sensitivity with more scanners, and more scatter, or lower sensitivity and no scatter. And they asked the medical doctors to detect lesions in the image, and they also asked them, and tell us if you like the image or not. And they found that the medical doctors systematically like image A better than image B, but their performance was better on image B than on image A. So they're not always good. They're often very good at assessing their own performance, but not always. And especially if you offer them something new, then they don't have build up a database yet to evaluate the new stuff. And then they can be wrong and they say, no, I don't like it. It looks, it looks unfamiliar to me. I don't think it's very good. They're always a bit conservative because they want to use uh, their, their prior knowledge. So in that way, they're not reliable. So we should not just ask them, do you like it or not? We should try to measure, make them apply the clinical task and see if they do that better. And if you then show them, well, you didn't like the image, but see, you're doing better, then they will quickly change their mind. And once they have been working a while with those new images, they will start liking them if, if the performance is really good. All right, and that's it here. So yeah, if you, and as you know, very often we do simulations and then uh, everything works fine. If it doesn't work fine on simulations, then you better do something else. If it works fine on simulations, then you go to phantoms and it's always worse on phantoms because there is a lot of stuff that can go wrong there. And then often we would go to animals and then to clinic. However, in pet, because we work with tracer amounts, we can actually quickly go to patients. In, in, in MR, it's even easier because MR is considered completely harmless. So the MR people are always doing new fancy stuff directly in patients. We are a bit more conservative, but actually going quickly to men is possible with, with uh, many tracers. All right. And then the last uh, several slides are on dosimetry. <coughs> um, so I give a short introduction and then show some examples, but there are some exercises in the course and I think it's useful to do them. So in practice, you'll never have to make those calculations because the computer will do it for you, but it's useful to, to have an idea what the computer is actually doing for you. So that's not a complete black, black box. And for that, as you will see, I've designed some very simple examples and it's useful to solve a few of those. And then if, if you get the right result, you know, okay, I got it, then I'm good. So, okay, for dosimetry, <coughs> we want to determine how much damage is done by the radiation. And the first estimate is to see, well, what is the radiation doing? It's putting some energy in tissue and that's probably not good. So we are gonna measure that energy that is put in tissue and that is done, uh, that value as unit gray, which equals Euler per kilogram. So it's energy per uh, mass tissue. But of course, MR also puts energy in the tissue because during an MR scan, you know, some heat is generated. Uh, you, you get warmer, but you cool yourself down and there are no ionizations. So it's not because you put some energy in someone's body that, that something has to go wrong. But we know we are using ionizing radiation. So more energy probably means more ions and those ions are bad. They can ruin your DNA. And then it turns out that different particles 
produce different amount of damage for the same amount of energy. And so in, we are always working with photons, electrons, and positrons. So electrons often we don't want, but all these races tend to uh, kick around some electrons too. So we have to take those into account too, and positrons of course too. And they have what is called a quality factor of about one. It's not exactly one, but it's about one. Neutrons and protons, they do a lot more damage. They go to 10 and even heavier particles go to 20. So these are rules of thumb. Actually, these values depend on the energy. For higher energy, I think they will go up or down. I'm not sure, I think go up. So, but for us, usually we're good with one. <clears throat> and then what we have to do is to multiply this gray with that quality factor. And then it's no longer gray because now it's supposed to be a measure of damage. And then we call it sieve or hopefully millisievert, because the sievert is really a lot of damage. And the damage basically comes from uh, doing damage to DNA. But as you know, we can repair our DNA. So if you do a single ionization in a DNA, then that's typically repaired because there is some redundancy to it. But if you do uh, create a few errors in a in a single DNA molecule at a very short distance, then that's hard to repair. So the redundancy can be exhausted and then the repair is no good. And so heavy particles, they interact much more quickly. So they spread their energy over a shorter distance, putting a lot more ionizations over a short distance. And so the chance of them doing damage, multiple damages to a DNA string is higher. And so that, that is why the same energy does more damage. And so these alpha particles, they interact very heavily. And so they, they are much more dangerous than photons and electrons. All right. Yeah, so how to compute it? Well, it's pretty straightforward, actually. But it, it, it's very uh, involved. So for example, if you have a positron emitter sitting here, you can compute the damage done by that positron emitter that sits here to another organ, for example, this one, or maybe the organ itself. And so that in this MIRT formalism, so they say, well, for every organ, we will compute the damage done by the activity in that organ and also by activity everywhere else in the body. And then for each combination, you have to do basically not the cattle simulation or otherwise a very careful analytical integration. So for the positron emitter, it doesn't travel very far. The positron range is for every G, just 0.6 millimeters. Well, that's the, the mean, so it, it's a whole distribution. So usually it irradiates the local tissues, but then produces a photon, and these photons, they, they can go very far. So they might interact here, but they also might um, escape and irradiate another organ. And so this organ will irradiate itself, but it will also get radiation from neighboring organs. They can also emit uh, photons that uh, Go here. So what we have to do is to integrate all that for every organ. So we have organ A and organ B, and again, B could be equal to A. So what we have to do is to run over all emissions of the tracer that is in A, because it will emit, for example, uh, yeah, for, for us in PET, the interesting thing is 511 photons, but it will also produce uh, positrons, of course, and often there are some other emissions that don't lead to imaging, so we don't even know them by heart. But if you look in the tables, you will see that a lot of other stuff is happening that we usually don't think of. But all that stuff will irradiate the patient. So we run over all the emissions. And then for every emission, we compute how many of those we have per second. And then, uh, yeah, first per second, and then integrate it over the entire time that they are in A to compute how many emissions in total there will be in A for that particular radiation. Then we compute the probability that, that the particles emitted will make it from A to B, which is this probability. Then we multiply it with the, the energy of that particular emission, and we divide it by the mass of B. So then until here, this part then becomes gray, because this is the energy, this is the mass. So it's gray, but just gray as total energy put in that entire organ. We don't care where it happens in that organ. And then we multiply it with the QI, because it could emit positrons, but also protons, maybe, or, or, or uh, other particles. So we have to uh, multiply it with that Q value to get 
the millisieverts uh, deposited by A in B. All right. And basically, that's what um, these uh, um, Olinda and other algorithms are computing. So basically, these algorithms have um, some predefined patients. Initially, there was just one. Now, there is a man, a woman, a few children. Then in the patient, um, oh, sorry, yeah. Here, here is an example of that, so, which is in the course and you, that you could check. So I made it as simple as possible because it's a bit boring to do these calculations, but just complicated enough so you, you can see the effect. And so here is an object, here is another one. And I put a, a either iodine or if, a fluor in the center of that organ. And then you can compute how much radiation that is putting in this, this organ and in that organ. And so for example, I had done one, two, three as, as um, the 159 kilo electron volt peak, which is the interesting one that we use for imaging, but that has only a branching ratio of 84%, but it will also emit electrons at considerable energy. And so it has a half-life of 13 hours. We need to take that into account. So here, because these are phantoms, we will just assume this thing stays here forever and we will keep on doing the, the experiment until the isotope has decayed. In practice, not like that. The trace concentrations in the organ change all the time. They change due to physical decay, but also due to biological effects. And so with that information, it's enough to compute. Well, you also need the attenuation coefficients and the dimensions. And then you can compute the probability of a particle to go from here to here, get attenuated here, and put some energy there. So, so in these calculations, I've simplified everything. Also, for example, it's in principle possible that the radiation goes in here and escapes there, but most of the radiation either will get attenuated or, or has to travel the whole thing. So it's dramatically simplified to keep it entertaining and to give you an idea what is happening. But of course, it can, once you do it in a pro in a computer, it can just as well make a decent program and take into account all these details. In real life, it's much more complicated because there will be Compton scatter most of the time and that scattered photon has a different energy, a different direction. And depending on what happened, it is more likely to interact again. So in principle, you have to take all of that into account. In these simple calculations, we don't. But still, these simple calculations give you the right order of magnitude and will show you that this guy gets much more radiation from itself than that guy will be irradiated by that control. And an important, for example, for FDG, a very important contributor to the dose is the positron. And for example, for radioactive oxygen, the positron is doing more damage than the two photons that are produced. For FDG, it's not true, it's usually the other way around. So in practice, if you have a new tracer, then what is done is to follow the patient over time. So we need a few volunteers. Well, first, typically do some animals, inject them and see if the tracer more or less behaves as expected. And then we need a few healthy volunteers. Once based on these animal studies and on prior knowledge, we know we can be injected in humans. A few volunteers are asked, they will get the tracer injected, and then there is a long follow-up to see if that tracer is really doing what we think it, it's going to do and compute uh, the time activity curves in all the important organs where there is significant accumulation of the tracer. So somebody has to draw regions, which is very boring. And the, that's the reason why a lot of people are now working on training neural networks to do that for us, because it would be very nice if we could uh, do a CT scan and a PET scan and then run the neural network, which would simply delineate all the organs in the CT, because if we could do that, then we could do a personalized dose calculation using multi cattle simulation. That would be very interesting, definitely for therapy, and we could do it every now and then for dosimetry too, to get a better idea of the true radiation of our Again, for dosimetry, we can be sloppy. The idea is the result should be very low, otherwise we have a problem. All right, so the PET will give us the Becquerel, Becquerel per cc, and Becquerel is the number of particles emitted per second. So we need to integrate that over the time, taking into account that the concentration is always changing. And so here is this changing concentration. 
Um, for example, this is the liver for a particular tracer. I don't even remember which one. It's a receptor in the brain. And so the liver uh, will get part of that uh, tracer. And here are three patients. And so you see the, the measurement points. The, the patient is followed in a few scans. And in the beginning, we expect more change. So we sample over time more often. And then uh, at late time points, the patient is imaged again to see where the trace is now. And then we simply interpolate between these points. And typically, this, this follow-up is done for uh, several half-lives of tracers so that based on the tracer physics, we already know that later uh, measurements will not produce a lot of uh, contribution anymore. All right, so then, yeah, you have curves for all the organs. And then either from tables or from Monte Carlo simulation, you know, okay, if there is so much activity in the liver, then the, the brain will suffer so much radiation from what is in the liver here. So these things are tabulated uh, based on Monte Carlo simulation for standard patients. And then uh, and for typical, uh, for different energies. And so that means uh, you, you can go in that cup table and say, okay, I have this dynamic curve for the liver. If I integrate them, then that's so many emissions in the liver. And then I can enter that in that table and that table will say, well, for a standard patient, the irradiation of the brain by the activity in the liver is gonna be so much. Of course, if the patient is a bit shorter and a bit thicker, it's gonna be different. So it's not personalized. These are just standard patients to personalize them somewhat. There are different, uh, different models of uh, thicker and thinner patients and then Okay, then you have all that, and then you can say, okay, now I know the uh, marrow and the colon and, and all these organs got so much uh, midi gray. And then they get the weight, <clears throat> and the reason they get different weights is that different organs are more sensitive to radiation than other organs. And so there is a list of, of all these organs, and then um, they're all given a weight. And so the, the currently, the weights that are used are effective those, um, and they're from 2007. But anyway, so the idea is that all these weights, so there's five of these, five times 0.12 is 0.6, and then all the weights add together to get one. So you do an average weight of the total grays deposited in the patient. So you don't compute the gray to the patient, you compute an average weight. So you can be higher or lower than the actual gray uh, given to the patient. And then that's turned into millisiever, in, in our case, by multiplying it with one. And then we say, okay, the patient got so many millisiever. A single value to characterize the whole thing, which is obviously not enough, but it gives us a, a crude uh, idea of if we're good or not. Um, no, no, this is not the example. All right, so but here is an example of fluorodeoxyglucose, um, which you can find in, I guess, report 19 here. Again, here are all the organs, um, and here are the milligrays per uh, megabecquerel. So if you inject one megabecquerel to the patient, you will do send typically about uh, 1.6 uh, or 0 0.16 milligray to the lab. All right. And then multiplying all these values with the appropriate weights, adding them together says, okay, for every G in an adult, you, do, you have uh, about uh, 20 microsievert per megabecquerel uh, injected. And it's different for uh, different people. It goes up dramatically because if you inject a megabecquerel in a child, of course, then the, you will have much more... Uh, a much higher concentration of radioactivity. All right. And then, um, <clears throat> yeah, just to give you an idea. So if we say a few millisieverts is harmless, actually it takes you a whole year to accumulate it from nature. But then again, there is a lot of variation. There are places in the world where the background radiation is like 10 times higher, not necessarily generating 10 times more 
cancer in those patients. <clears throat> So actually, we know that a lot of radiation is really very bad for you. And if you double that, it's at least twice as bad. But extrapolating to low radiation is extremely difficult because the chances, even if you extrapolate and the predicted chances are so low that they become very hard to measure. So nobody really knows what happens at very low radiation levels. And there are people that say, well, probably they're even harmless because we're designed by evolution to deal with a little bit of radiation because that's been happening to Mother Earth all the time. But that's dangerous. So there is, it, it is known that we don't know it, but it's a dangerous idea to tell everyone, well, actually, at low levels, no harm is done because then they say, oh, then we can give a low level today and a low level tomorrow in the day. And then that way you could accumulate much more than a few millisieverts over a year. And that definitely is doing that. And to some extent, we're already doing that because, like, you get typically, there are many countries where the average radiation induced by medicine is larger than the radiation induced by nature. And that's pretty alarming because actually, most of the people get almost no radiation from medicine. That, that means that the ones that do get radiation from medicine really get an awful amount such that the mean to the total population is higher than the, the background radiation. So we're probably overdoing it. And there is more and more awareness that the doses are probably way too high and that we should uh, decrease them as much as possible. So if you inject for FTG about 300 megabecquerel, which is uh, more than what we typically do, you will get six millisieverts. <coughs> and for technetium, um, with 740 megabecquerel, you get 11 millisieverts. So it's, this is uh, more than twice as much, and you get about twice as much radiation. Although the energy of technetium is only 140 keV, and of PET, it's 511. But the problem is the half-life of technetium, which is much longer than that of FTG. So, Depending on the tracer, if it accumulates, uh, then, then the radiation can be more. For the people working, uh, for the nurses, it's the other way around because technetium is well attenuated by the patient and they don't have to be next to that patient all the time. So they're exposed uh, to less radiation if they're with a, a technetium patient than if they're with a PET patient because the PET photons have much better penetrating power, and they're more likely to get attenuated in your body rather than that patient. So the, if we look at dosimeters of the uh, technologists working in the pet, they always get a higher dose than the ones that do single photon. And that's why there is a rotation. So the, they all do everything. Although actually for the skills, it would probably be better if we had dedicated pet technologists and dedicated single photon technologists because they are um, the systems are significantly different. But that is not done because then the, the pet group would have a higher radiation. They would all still stay below the level of, of um, 20 millisieverts per year. But we want to be well below that. 